Money. Today on Note Nook, we play Where's George? New Zealand was part of the British Empire during King George VI reign, but he was not featured on their paper money. Let's find out why. I'm Dr. Brad Hafford, archaeologist and economic anthropologist. Welcome to Note Nook, where I decode various stories embedded within paper money, all the while uncovering interesting facts about countries and people around the world. Today, I'm looking at a one-pound note issued in New Zealand in the 1940s. We look first at the obverse, or front of the note. Typically, the front emphasizes the issuing authority and might display an image of an important person from the country. Especially on older notes, that person was most often the head of government or a former leader. At the time, New Zealand was a dominion of the British Empire. Other dominions, like Canada and Australia, featured the British King George VI on their paper money. In New Zealand, he appeared on coins, but not on paper money. Instead, on this example, we have the British explorer Captain James Cook. Captain Cook was the first European to circumnavigate and map the North and South Islands in 1769. Of course, he didn't discover New Zealand. Native peoples, developing into the distinct Maori culture, had lived there for hundreds of years before. Plus, the Dutch explorer, Abel Tasman, had sighted one of the islands as he sailed past in 1642. And it was the Dutch who provided the name New Zealand. So Cook was part of the history of the islands, but he doesn't really represent the issuing authority. The immediate authorization for the note is seen in the upper text. The Reserve Bank of New Zealand, which was established only a few years before this note, in 1934. But the larger scale authority is represented by the symbols directly beneath. This is the coat of arms of New Zealand that was in use from 1911 to 1956. It acknowledges Britain's importance to the overarching Commonwealth and Empire by displaying the English lion holding the Union Jack atop the shield. But it also puts focus on the islands and their resources. Within the shield, there are symbols of trade, mining, and agriculture. At left, we see a European woman holding the flag of New Zealand, while at right is a native Maori man holding a Taiaha weapon in a protective stance. Beneath is the motto, Onward. Text further beneath states that the bank will pay the sum of one pound on demand to the bearer if presented at the bank headquarters in Wellington. This shows that the paper was a stand-in for precious metal coinage that most people trusted as currency. At this time, some British and New Zealand coins were still struck in silver, but they had been officially debased to 50% silver content. The pound was made up of 20 silver shillings, or 240 copper pence, and was issued in the same sizes and denominations in New Zealand as in Britain. In fact, British coinage and some Australian had been legal tender in New Zealand long before the nation issued its own coins, and some continued in use up until 1967 when the currency changed to a decimalized dollar. Next, we see the signature of the chief cashier of the bank, T.P. Hanna. He was in that office from 1940 to 1955, and notes with his signature were issued throughout that time. Most banknotes carry signatures of financial officials as further proof that the bank guarantees that the notes are exchangeable. Nowadays, we're accustomed to money being nothing more than paper and base metal, or even just numbers stored on computers, but paper money was not always so trusted. It's just an IOU after all, but if issued by a trusted institution, then it can circulate. Of course, it needs to be regulated and monitored, or a flood of homemade versions will destroy confidence. That's why paper money tends to be so intricately detailed, to make it hard to copy. Background shading lines in different colors are part of the less directly noticed complexity of this note. But there is a more prominent colorful background in complicated geometries here as well. It's made up of spirals and organic designs that are based on native Maori iconography. The borders of the note also have fabulous waves and crenulations that are partly based on Maori tattooing, which is called tomoko. It starts with stylized leaves, then 
spirals, and it moves up to a seemingly carved design at the side, culminating in a fierce face or mask. Such masks are often found in Maori art. This is my favorite part of the note, a kind of detail that can easily escape notice, but when you find it, you don't forget it. There are some rather standard web-like patterns in the corner behind the denomination. These are typical of British and North American printers, as the lacy intertwining is seen to be hardest to reproduce. We also find the serial number and repeated text, Reserve Bank of New Zealand, one pound, behind Hannah's signature. One more security feature is present, a watermark. This is an image embedded in the paper itself, made by varying the thickness of the paper so the image can only be seen when a light shines through from behind. The image in this case is a native man, specifically King Tofiao, the second king of the Maori people from 1860 to 1894. This is another easily missed detail and perhaps a little surprising. Many notes have watermarks, but they often simply repeat the main printed figure. Not only is this one not a repeat of Captain Cook, but it's also not the next most likely representation, King George. Instead, it's a former Maori king, representing the indigenous culture of the islands. Then again, maybe it shouldn't be so surprising. King Tafiao had appeared as the main printed portrait on the first issue reserve bank notes in 1934. The Captain Cook notes were the second issue, beginning in 1940. On these, Tafiao moved to the watermark and to a profile representation instead of full face. But we can still see the feather in his hair and just make out the ceremonial tattoos on his face. So now let's look at the reverse. Typically, the reverse of a banknote will emphasize the value of the note and the laws that protect it. This one displays the value pretty clearly in many places, but it bears little other text. It does reiterate the issuing authority, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, and it bears the name of the printers, Thomas De La Rue, in London. There is less color here, only the mauve over print in slightly varying shades, but there is intricate design. It's not as interesting as the more Maori-inspired border on the obverse, in my opinion, since here it's just the web or lace design that's found on many banknotes. Admittedly, the overlapping folds and scalloped edges add some interest. They are meant to reflect the maritime theme, mimicking waves on the ocean and even with a bit of ocean spray spirals. The central image is truly maritime, displaying a sailing ship on the ocean with part of the New Zealand landscape in the background. The North and South Islands of New Zealand are obviously surrounded by water, and Cook mapped the islands in the ship that is here depicted, the HMS Endeavour. The image thus unites the theme of the front, Captain Cook and King Tafiao, with their realms, the ocean and the islands. New Zealand sits about 2,000 kilometers east of Australia and is made up of two large islands with around 600 smaller ones. Although the world was at war for the first half of the 1940s and Anzac troops were part of the Allied forces, the note does not reflect the difficulties that wartime placed on the islands. Instead, it reflects back on the 18th and 19th centuries. The portrait of Cook featured on the note was painted in 1775 only six years after his first voyage to New Zealand. The expedition gathered not only geographical information, but also botanical and zoological. He made two more voyages later to use New Zealand as a base in the search for Antarctica. But why no King George? First of all, as a dominion from 1907, rather than a colony, New Zealand was a self-governing member of the Commonwealth. Although it recognized the British monarch as head of state, it had no obligation to feature him on money. It was the last of the British dominions to establish a national bank and issue its own currency, though, in 1934, and some suggest that the design for the notes was rushed. The first notes were meant to be temporary, but they featured the second Maori king, Tafiao, prominently. The second edition notes seemed to hide him away in favor of more European elements. Colonial notes, or notes issued by one group in lands that it has subsumed, typically disregard the native culture of those lands, seeing only the exploitable resources and their own colonial power. This note is guilty of that, depicting as it does the British explorer and his ship above all else. But it does attempt to display native arts and people in some ways. 
1840, Maori chiefs signed the Treaty of Watangi, bringing their islands into the British Empire and giving the Maori people the same rights as British citizens. There were many attempts to disregard the treaty, however, and by the 1870s, some had declared it to be null and void. But increasingly through the 20th century, it came to be a rallying cry, and in 1974, Waitangi Day became a national holiday. New Zealand has made many strides in connecting its people and has achieved many great things, including a 100% literacy rate. Please consider liking and subscribing if you enjoyed this note and its history. I'm Dr. Brad Hafford. Join me again next time on Note Nook, part of my series, Money Talks.